Hello, everyone. I'm very uh, excited today to have our guest here today is our good friend, Assemblyman Evan Lowe, who is actually currently still in Sacramento, uh, stuck there over the weekend because he has to get the budget finalized by June 15th uh, with this huge budget deficit that we are facing uh, in such short order. Uh, I would love to uh, uh, ask uh, Evan to tell us more. Uh, in the meantime, just a quick introduction. Uh, Evan and I have been friends for uh, probably a couple of decades now, right, Evan? Uh, Absolutely. We're, we're, we're in high school back then, right? Something like that. <laughs> it's going back quite some time. Some Thanks time. for the reminder, Otto. <laughs> and, and, you know, we've seen uh, Evan was uh, uh, amazingly uh, 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 hardworking, uh, first got elected in the Campbell uh, City Council, uh, served there also as mayor, and then eventually got elected onto the uh, State Assembly, uh, representing the uh, 24th District, correct? Right. Uh, yes. And uh, and before that, you also work in the office of Assemblyman Paul Fong. Uh, so we've been knowing each other for a long time. He's been very active in our community, serving uh, the API community and the broader community, LGBT community as well. Uh, it's a great representative. Uh, so thank you so much for being here, Evan. Uh, and uh, so for today, uh, we could talk a little bit about uh, what you're working on in Sacramento. Uh, on the budget, and maybe we could also talk a little bit about what's going on uh, these few days, especially with the George Floyd incident. So go ahead, the floor is yours, Evan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, first and foremost, thanks, Otto, for the opportunity. I hope you and your entire family are safe uh, during this time. And um, uh, so, so much is recognized with respect to our commitment and our obligation to be interconnected and that we must be active citizens and helping to be invested in everyone's shared success. And the key word, of course, is shared success. I don't need to tell you that as someone who has served on the Sunnyvale City Council and it continues to seek public office uh, and has served as a veteran, a commitment, very patriotic to our country. And so these type of things are important to the values, specifically, again, in light of May as being Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, for all of us to reaffirm our commitment to democracy, uh, because our democracy is only as strong as we are engaged and active. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, sort of on a lighter note, uh, that we've known each other for over a few decades, which is actually quite true. Uh, I think I'm going close to my 15th, or 15th year or so with respect to uh, public office, uh, but you sort of take a look back at uh, all of the institutional knowledge that we've had and part of the struggles and challenges that we equally have had as well. But uh, again, it is one that uh, I take very seriously and it's truly an honor to continue to serve. Uh, you talked about sort of just briefly then what we're dealing with in the state of California with a $54 billion deficit. Now imagine this, Otto. In, the, in January of 2020, earlier this year, we began with close to $7 billion with a surplus. Surplus. Uh, addition, Mm -hmm. with addition of close to $20 billion in rainy day funds. So mm -hmm. uh, close to a high, high two, uh, $20 billion plus dollars uh, with, with a cushion. And that's for saved by, over the past like eight or 10 years, right? Those are the savings when yes. Jerry Brown was doing all this. Correct? That's right. And, I mean, and, and, and you know this, uh, right. I mean, uh, well, we, we do like to spend because we also want to be audacious and go sure. beyond the fundamental cores because we believe that we want to be as transformative as possible, and that takes courage. So yes, we, we do like to spend resources on a wide variety of transformational programs. But having said that, this has sort of tapered down our ambitions, and so we're going to look at that core. But again, starting with a close to $30 billion uh, buffer, uh, right now $54 billion deficit in just five months. So it goes to show you how difficult public budgeting can be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and thanks for being, uh, being there working so hard on weekends, too. Uh, obviously, I know you up out here in Campbell, but you've got to stay up there in Sacramento to, to make sure the budgets pass on time. Uh, and so many people uh, in this state, uh, you know, uh, 30 million people in California, it certainly depends on it. And of course, we have the highest unemployment rate ever. Uh, recorded in our history um, if, until the Great Depression, probably in the 20s. Uh, so this is only some difficult times that we are uh, seeing moving forward. Now, uh, on, the, on the budget front, uh, what do you see as the most likely outcome in terms of some of the services that will be most affected that you would like to let people know? 
Well, let, let's take, for example, uh, a situation that I have in the 28th Assembly District that I represent. Auto, mm -hmm. imagine this. Uh, we are Silicon Valley, home to more mm -hmm. venture capital than any other region in the, in the nation, and also one of the more affluent communities in the United States, the most mm -hmm. uh, wealthy country in the world. Mm -hmm. And yet in the Cupertino School District, one of the largest school districts, uh, we are now approaching a sixth consecutive year of budget cuts uh, because of the funding uh, formula that the district has. Now this happened before the COVID crisis mm -hmm. and now exacerbated by this COVID pandemic, in addition to the state cuts, the school is, has options now of potentially uh, faced with closing schools, with sharing principals, class sizes, uh, all of the above. And yet we are also in the jurisdiction of one of the most wealthy, valuable companies in the world, which is that of Apple. So how is this possible? You, in the same region, you're gonna have six consecutive years of cuts, and yet the most valuable company in, in California and the second most valuable company in the world, and yet we have these cuts. There is something systemically wrong with how we fund our public education. Let me also just mention, Otto, is that over, of our overlapping areas, uh, there was a measure put on the ballot that failed uh, this past election to which voters had the opportunity to increase funding for the Cooper Union School District. So having said that, I think there's a disconnect between that of the type of values of the institutions that we have in our community and how we fundamentally uh, fund our public institutions that we value and support. Right. Yeah, no, I think it is so important important, uh, as, as we all uh, can understand, and for some lobbyists who might not know, one of the biggest budget items for the state legislature is the K-12 through uh, education. Uh, the public school systems really is funded mostly by our state budget, and it's so crucial that when, when we're having deficit, what it really meant a lot of times is directly affecting is our school's funding, and of course that means what our kids, uh, what the resources is going to our children. Uh, as you know, Evan, I have three kids in, 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 uh, in K through 12, uh, 15, 12, and a nine-year-old, right? So Beautiful uh, growing kids, too. Growing very fast, and uh, you know, we've got high school, we've got middle school, we've got elementary school, i got all of them. Uh, and uh, certainly really feeling the, the, the need of how, how important what you are doing to make sure that our school funding is, is provided. And then a lot of it too is also demographic changes, housing affordability uh, that causes, for example, like Cupertino, the housing costs over there. I mean, a, a small three bedroom, two bath is what, one and a half million dollars plus, right? And yeah. what, how, how many families can afford that? And so you know you you have double income making hundred thousand dollars and you still won't qualify for a loan. Right. So these type of situation where I think there's less and less uh, families with children living in Cupertino, I think due to the, uh, the declining enrollment, is causing the funding uh, formula to to start losing money funding the, the district, which is very very sad. Right, right. And this is not just as you well know, this is not just within the boundaries of the city of Cupertino, but beyond and yeah. other cities as well too. So. And of course, this is not just systemic just to one school district. We're seeing this in many other parts uh, throughout the state. But, you know, I was curious, uh, when you talk to individuals now, as you are interfacing uh, very much so during this time, especially during an election season, uh, what are people saying with respect to what they value? And do they have an appetite for the type of funding, the critical funding that is necessary to having the type of institutions that we want to see? Yes, I think people are fully aware of the need to fund education because I think in many ways, um, even homeowners that might not have kids understand the importance of school ranking because it's very directly correlated. If you are at the top you know, 5, 10, 20 percent uh, of the school uh, scoring system, if your school is ranked very highly, uh, the property value usually correlates with that. So I, I think there's actually a, a, a pretty strong feeling of why people believe in keeping our school well funded is, is important. I'm actually quite surprised like you were how that uh, funding initiative did not pass uh, this past, past election. But again, at the same time, maybe there's uh, other uh, issues involved. And, and now that with COVID-19, I think people's thinking are very much changed to the importance of public health. 
uh, and regarding shelter in place and with the high unemployment, uh, I'm sure there's so many more other uh, corollary issues. I mean, as you, you've known, uh, when you go to the food pantry, you go to the, the lines, every week those lines are getting longer and longer. You know, first couple of weeks after COVID, you know, shelter in place, the effect seems to be pretty dramatic. But now we're seeing that the, the you know, two months into this, this program, people are really hurting. Uh, and even though some of the counties are slowly opening up, uh, you know, even restaurants or whatnot, they have to keep the social distancing. Uh, the number of people will be hired back, we know will be far less than what they were, say, back in you know, late February, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the need is, is, is very uh, uh, extreme. And, and, and I think, you know, leading to that is, I think with all the frustration, people being cooked up in the house, then you show up with all these videos that we see regarding the most recent one with George Floyd uh, being killed uh, under the knee of this Minneapolis police officer. Uh, even though the police officer has not been charged with both uh, murder and, uh, and, and, and and manslaughter, right? First degree, a third degree murder, I think, and manslaughter. But you can still see the anger. And there's so many protests nationwide that we haven't seen for a long time. Most of the protests we've seen were more locally in, in certain areas. But now this time, I think it's really a, a nationwide issue. Uh, what is your view on this? And what do you think we could do to help unite our community together again? Yeah, well, gosh, uh, Otto, how much time do we have to talk? <laughs> really? uh, to right. say that that goes without saying that our mm -hmm. heart goes out to uh, so many of the individuals who see this on an everyday basis. This is systemic. Uh, we mm -hmm. are in the month of May still, and this is Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So allow this to be a call to action for Asian Pacific Islanders to also engage and join in the brother and sisterhood of the collective action that we take. And unfortunately, we seem to see that um, many within the Asian Pacific Islander community tend to be more uh, apathetic with respect to social justice uh, on a wide lens of things, which is to say, you know, we have a women's march, we have Black Lives Matter, we have uh, LGBT Pride Month, the Gay Pride March and the riots. Uh, we have March for Our Lives and Firearms, but you don't see one big social justice march uh, with respect to Asian Pacific Islanders. Uh, and when you think about the history, though, of immigration in um, the 1960s, uh, to which the immigration in the United States was based upon that of the skill sets mm -hmm. that Asian Pacific Islanders had. Uh, so when we think about this notion of meritocracy, that everyone should just be equal and get it on their own. No, we faced the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Uh, and that uh, the alien land law in California to which Mongoloids cannot own property. Uh, these are the type of things that we also uh, have had an experience on. Or even that uh, more recently, the killing of Vincent Chin. So when you see the absolute murder of a community member, you can see the type of outrage. So we should actually remember our own history and join in solidarity for those who are fighting for significant change and we need to demonstrate unconditional allyship with respect to what we see and right. that is what is so very important that this is not just solely a black issue but this is right. an, an issue and i know that you also uh have echoed those similar type of comments consistent with the conversation you and i have also had mm -hmm. and then as we know it's like the the we say black lives matter Brown lives matter, obviously all lives and all of us uh, who is in this. And, and in, in many ways, as she said, it, it's so important because it's only a what, couple of months ago when uh, there was these uh, allegations of virus being Chinese and, and then you start to see some Chinese uh, violence throughout the country uh, in various ways, whether it's uh, uh, temple, Buddhist temple being desecrated or uh, uh, even uh, Asian families uh, that got stabbed. Uh, and so in Texas, so these are the type of situations that we see. And I think it's so important to, to see the systemic racism. Uh, and, and, and this morning, I just heard that the National Security Advisor say, oh, there's no systemic racism, it's just a few bad apples. Uh, and I think this, this unfortunate misunderstanding and, and ignorance of what's going on in this country has just gone for too long. And that's what the frustration is coming out with, right? Yeah, and I absolutely hope that we will eventually be able to channel that protest energy into electoral energy, that we need to work through the system to engage and hold our public representatives accountable and ensuring that we all can speak out for those communities as well. You know, again, uh, in light of Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we too felt fear of 
jogging outside, feeling mm -hmm. victim of a hate crime during this COVID pandemic, that this is the Chinese virus. And no similarly, in, you, in case you see uh, those in the black community jogging and being killed and murdered in Georgia. So the correlations are so stark. Mm -hmm. And even just this week, Otto, we yeah. have seen legislation, discriminatory legislation, uh, introduced by Republican Senator Tom Cotton that would prohibit and ban Chinese international students coming to the United States, a modern day Chinese exclusion act. And this is exacerbating the xenophobia and perpetuating that uh, we are always going to be foreigners and that we're never truly American, that we are spies. And we saw this in the 2000s with American scientist, Dr. Wen Ho Lee was wrongly accused of being a spy to which the American government had to apologize. And these are the type of things that we must speak out on. But again, we get complacent and we forget. So we must not forget and we must recognize that atrocity towards one community, we are all part of the same and we must equally show our allyship. That's right, injustice to one is injustice to all. And, you know, as they say, you know, uh, this happens to somebody else, I don't care. It happens to somebody else, I don't care. Well, that happens to us, now what? Right, and that's why right. I think we need to be united. Now, right. along with that, there's a lot of uh, other type of violence uh, that's been attributed to a protest, and it's got all mixed up. Uh, for example, there have been some looting yesterday I saw on Union Square. They talk about looting at some of the high-end stores in Union Square. And, and people are lumping all those with protesters, which is extremely confusing. Maybe you could say something about that message. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there needs to be a distinction and, and really looking at the nuance to this, uh, that unfortunately, uh, there is a small segment that may try to uh, jeopardize and uh, hijack the main focus of the protest. And the m vast majority of individuals are peacefully protesting. And unfortunately, the media tends to sensationalize the bad apples. And by the way, many of these bad apples are not protesters. Uh, they are anarchists and are criminals and should be prosecuted. They're just robbers and thieves, basically, go on the, uh, taking advantage of the opportunity. Go to Best Buy to get their big screen TV or Ferragamo to get some handbags. And, uh, and we certainly need to make sure we separate them from what the, outside, right. the, the protesters are doing these, uh, uh, what they are exercising their First Amendment rights. That's right. That's right. And, you know, part of the other thing is about, again, understanding our own identity. And as we transition from May to June, uh, June is LGBTQ Pride Month. Uh, yes. And as someone who's openly LGBT, knowing what it's like to feel the discrimination that currently exists uh, mm -hmm. in this nation, uh, the impetus uh, for the majority, I mean, how the LGBT rights, civil rights movement began was at the Stonewall riots in which mm -hmm. members of the LGBT community in New York protested and rioted equally. Exactly. So we have also learned in solidarity from those that have come before us. And we must recognize, again, the intersectionality that exists and speak in partnership as much as possible. Exactly. And uh, yeah, no, us working with the different community is so important. Uh, and uh, watching what happened in San Jose on Friday night and Saturday night actually is quite different. Apparently Friday night, it was, there was certainly more violence uh, and tear gases, but as of uh, Saturday night, I, I do see that people passing out beef jerkies, uh, <laughs> uh, symptoms, uh, and, uh, and uh, somebody playing guitar, right? So that's the type of peaceful process they want to see. Yes, yes, I mean, in auto, I don't know if you saw this too, um, but for those that are also watching, um, mm -hmm. there are incredible stories of allyship, patriotism, love and compassion from those who are in positions of power. And that has come specifically also from the police chief of San Jose uh, in which he gave a talk to a briefing at an academy talking about the tarnished nature of that bad apple and that officer tarnishing and that is the obligation for those who put on the uniform, those men and women who put on the uniform to demonstrate the best of, of, the, of law enforcement and that is their responsibility. And I think in that sense, I think we are very fortunate to be living in uh, the Silicon Valley where our elected leaders and our police chiefs understand that difference, uh, understand the importance of engaging with the public and, and not to pose a threat because uh, these angers are, are clearly something that people have a, a reason to vent. Uh, and not to f throw fumes, unlike the guy in the White House we have, 
who talked about something about shooting and looting, and, and that's the last thing we need is to add more violence to the situation, is to diffuse it and, and, and get people out there to highlight a very significant problem in our community, as you said, the systemic uh, racism. Uh, and uh, so it's so important for us to be out there. I do remember seeing the, uh, our good friend, Rev Reverend Jethro Moore, uh, was actually on TV. He was actually in the front line between the, the protesters and the police and, and trying to defuse some situation. And, I, mm -hmm. and hats off all the great work he's doing in the front line. You know, obviously, it's very, very uh, fluid uh, and potentially explosive that he's risking his safety to be out there to, to uh, keep, keep people safe. So uh, hats off to what he's doing. Um, uh, anything else to add, uh, Evan, on the, on this subject? Well, yeah, you know, just if I, if I'd actually I'd just like to ask you what uh, you think we should be doing. I mean, again, I, I can speak, but then you also have a, a very important perspective to bring, again, as a former mayor of, of Sunnyvale and also as a patriotic uh, service member, as a father, uh, and as someone who is seeking public office. I mean, what, what should we be doing? Sure. Having worn a uniform for 20 years in the military, certainly uh, I have a lot of respect for those who wear the uniform, uh, whether you the uh, military or the police uh, services. Uh, and that being said, I think it's Im important to, to make sure that law and order is being uh, enforced because that not only protect uh, the general public, it actually protect the protesters mm. from not being hurt. What we're seeing is that there are idiots out there uh, ramming trucks or vans or their vehicle at the protesters uh, for whatever agenda they might have, right? And, and so I think it's so important to make sure that a, a police has the resources to do what they need to do. Uh, yet at the same time, you know, we, we, we don't need to over uh, ele elevate the, the, the tension by, by, by unnecessary use of, of force. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, to spell people, you need to do certain things. But when you see videos of, of uh, one police officer pulling off the, the mask of a, uh, uh, an individual who hands it up and then spray him with pepper spray, that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, that does not in, in danger, in, engender any, any goodwill. Uh, and, and, and I think the, the, there's a lot of tensions on both sides, but I really do think that uh, uh, we, we need to dial it down a bit. And of course, with the National Guard, I mean, over 13 states I heard this morning mm -hmm. has been caught up of National Guard. So a lot of the fellow uh, individuals in the National Guard and the reserves are being caught up for, for these type of uh, uh, duty shows you how serious this issue really is. And I hope that the public understands that, uh, that uh, you know, we are still living in a civil community. We have to respect each other. Uh, and uh, this this type of uh, of unrest is something that uh, that uh, really the the violence and looting is not uh, due to the protesters, and we need to make that very clear, uh, so that people don't lump everything together. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing people need to do right now uh, put their anger into action, and the action yeah. is to register to vote. Right. Right. At the end of the day, you know, until you vote, until that's how you, that's really the only way your voice could be heard. I don't care if you're a millionaire, a billionaire, or don't have a penny to your pocket. The right to vote is exactly equal. If you don't vote, then your voice not being heard, and then so the wrong people will be in power, like what we have in the White House, and see what we've got, right? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think so, so, so important to, to remember, and clearly, even as your other capacity, as a voting member at the national level uh, for the Democratic Party uh, at the DNC, I know that you are continuing to ensure that our party also uh, speaks clearly, coherently, and abides by the same type of values, and that we must be the party of inclusion versus exclusion, and that we need to hold our own people accountable as well, too. And I know that we'll be doing that in the party platform, again, as we transition from uh, the protest energy to electoral energy, uh, that of Joe Biden, we need to make it very clear as to why the Democratic Party will be the home of inclusion and love and that we will work very diligently to stamp out this type of institutional racism that exists. Right, exactly. Now, speaking of national politics, uh, we have a big election coming in November. Uh, we have the White House, but there are many other races which are just uh, as important, if not more. The United, United States Senate uh, for race, for example, over 33 uh, Senate seats will be up, and this will be one uh, occasion where there could be a very different uh, dynamics after Election Day, isn't it? Um, so, for example, we talk about states like Arizona, Colorado, 
Maine, uh, Montana, uh, there are many seats certainly held by Republican uh, senators, which we believe are actually extremely vulnerable. And even Mitch McConnell in his own home state in Kentucky, I think uh, he's only getting like 30 odd percent of a, a favorable rating, which is extremely low for serving uh, elected officials. So I, I do think that a uh, big change is, is clearly uh, possibly coming. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a call to action. Uh, and uh, yes, we need to do the important work in California as well, but I hope that individuals will also find time to go out and phone bank to travel to other, when safe, uh, to travel to other states, uh, to do phone banking, to do uh, the note cards, um, because I know I've seen you out on the campaign trail in other states, and we need to collectively make sure that we also get out the vote as well. Exactly. Well, this year I probably won't be in too many other states since I do have my own campaign yeah, to work your on. Own election, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we don't need to uh, to work hard on these national issues as well, because obviously the funding from the national government right now with this pandemic, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we can depend too much what the federal government is doing for us. Uh, the, the As Mitch McConnell has said, basically any type of new bills coming through uh, to fund uh, and support students or support our vulnerable communities are now dead in the water, uh, which is really, really sad. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Hope, yeah. We can, yeah, you we know, can, uh, well, well you know, when we uh, you know, transition then uh, into this November election for your supervisor, supervisor's uh, election uh, in Santa Clara County, uh, number one, I think it's so important and exciting that uh, there currently exists no Asian Pacific Islander Board of Supervisors, and yet the county consists of close to 40% Asian Pacific Islanders. So as we've been talking about representation, that is equally important, but also to make sure that we, I can speak to this again to those who are watching. I have known you and I've seen you over the past decades and you and Sally and uh, one begins to wonder, well, you could easily just go into the sunset uh, because you've already done your uh, public service, but no, you just keep coming back and wanting to serve and uh, we are very fortunate for that. So that's why I'm so enthusiastic about your candidacy and we'll do all that I can also to help uh, see you as successful as possible. Well, thank you very much, Evan, for your strong support. Uh, it means a lot to us. But it's really, really, we're all doing this, you know, look, if we're doing it for the money, really bad for the uh, math. <laughs> uh, it is about community. And, and I think the need of a community now is louder and, and more desperate than ever uh, during this COVID crisis. And thank you for your great work you're doing in Sacramento, fight, uh, fighting for us on our budget, on our issues, on our rights, uh, and, and making sure that the discrimination issues and all that is uh, very much uh, understood by others. And also, I want to uh, highlight one more thing, too, is uh, politics is not all partisan about Republican Democrats. Uh, the other day, I saw you at a different uh, forum. You were just talking to uh, State Senator Ling Ling Chang, who is, of course, oh, a yes. Republican. Oh, that's right. right. Yes. It's so important that we are able to maintain those relationships and friendship across the aisle, because that's the only way through bipartisan efforts that we work together to solve these problems. You know, COVID doesn't discriminate between male and female, wealth and poor, or Republican Democrats, right? Uh, so that's why it's so important that we actually do work together using our, our work. And thank you for your able to outreaching to all sides to, to come up with solutions for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you know, we represent all people, not just those that, that look like us or that share the same party affiliation, uh, but we represent all people. And that's what we need to do to be intentional about building the level of trust as much as possible uh, because we all breathe the same air, we live in the same state, and uh, care about the same people. Exactly. And, and we all know C.C. Yin, right, who is, of course, a very prominent Republican in our community, but he has certainly supported all of us, Democrats, right. uh, as well, right. uh, of, of our, our need because he understands the importance of uh, our community. So, again, I want to thank C.C. as well. Uh, and do you have any last word to add, Evan? Well, again, I guess I uh, hope that everyone will think about what they can do. Uh, it's one thing to just simply post and demonstrate solidarity, uh, but let's turn that into action exactly. and into effective action. Uh, so what are you going to do to help make sure that Joe Biden uh, gets elected and that we can fight for the values that we all care about? Uh, this will take time. Our democracy is fragile. Let, us, let this be a reminder that our democracy is fragile and requires all of us to be engaged. And that's what we need to be doing into this coming November election. Uh, let's do so safely. And we have great candidates like you, Otto, to help channel that energy into. All right. Thank you so, so much, Evan, for your time today. And keep up your good work in Sacramento and for everybody. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Otto. Good luck. Thank you.
All right.